welcome David Barton as he comes. Thanks, Rip. Appreciate it. I want to start this morning with a Bible verse. It's uh, Proverbs 10, 22. It's very simple. It says, the blessing of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow to it. And one of the things we find is that God's blessings are things that enrich our lives. Okay, that's logical. But it turns out that a lot of the greatest blessings we have are things we don't particularly notice. We didn't, don't even think about them. I, I learned this really the first time from Dr. Benjamin Rush. He's a signer of the Declaration of Independence, one of the founding fathers. Uh, John Adams said he was one of the three most notable founding fathers. John Adams said there was George Washington, Ben Franklin, and Benjamin Rush. And boy, we never studied him anymore. The guy was amazing. He started five universities. Three of them still go today. He started academic education for women. He signed the Declaration, ratified the Constitution served in three different presidential administrations, was the director of the U.S. Mint. He did the first faith-based prison reform in America. He's the greatest doctor in American history. 3,000 students got their medical degrees with his signature on the diploma. He was a professor of medicine at three universities at the same time. He started the Sunday School Movement in America. He started the first Bible Society in America. Uh, he actually started the first Abolition Society in America, helped start the first black denomination in America, trained the first black physician. I just keep going. Guys, unbelievable. We don't know anything about them today, but we're very blessed at our organization. We own about 100,000 documents from before 1812. So I own thousands of handwritten documents of George Washington and John Adams, etc., including Benjamin Rush's handwritten document. We got thousands of documents out of black history and out of, out of church history and out of military history and political history and whatever. And as a result, I've been appointed in a number of states by governors and state boards of education to do the history and social studies standards in those states. So going back to the originals we have, Benjamin Rush and his is, he's a very strong evangelical Christian, just Bible-centered guy. And in, we, we have his prayer journals where the, as he's going through the Scripture, he makes notes on what the Lord's showing him. And, and the prayer journals and his memoirs, he, he's just trying to be a, a, a good Christian and thank God for the blessings he's enjoyed. So he's going through and listening to all these blessings he has. And then he comes this morning and he's thanking God for the stuff. And he says, and, and I thank God for all the times I have not fallen downstairs. <laughs> what? But think about it. If you go up and down stairs and don't fall, that's a blessing, but you don't ever notice it. What you notice is when you fall. Now, that's not the blessing. But how many thousands of times you've gone up and down stairs and didn't fall? You, you go driving to the store for groceries and you didn't have a wreck and you got back home. You don't think about not having a wreck. Now, if you had a wreck, you think about it. And as it turns out, some of the greatest blessings we enjoy are things we rarely think about. Your health until you lose it. Your family until something happens. I mean, you're surrounded with things that you just take for granted every day. And it was like that for us this last Tuesday. This last Tuesday, we had the 4th of July. Newsflash, that was a world record. We've been 241 years under the same piece of paper. We just take it for granted. We have a 4th of July every year. We'll have one next year. Mm, not quite the way we think it is. It's a blessing we take for granted. For example, right now in the world, there's 195 nations of the U.N., do you know what the average length of a government is in the history of the world? Average length of government in the history of the world, 17 years. Ooh, we've been 241. I'm kind of happy we don't have to go through a revolution or a new constitution every 17 years like the rest of the world. I mean, that's a blessing of stability that we just take for granted. We just assume that America is going to always be here. Not necessarily so, but that, boy, we've been here 241 years. No wonder it's a world record when everything else averages 17. As a matter of fact, just to put it in perspective, you know, we've we got all these academic professors and stuff. We need to be like Europe. We need to be progressive like Europe. I think not. You know, France has had 15 governments since we've just had one. And you go across the world and imagine living in these other places where you have that much instability and turmoil. Jesus said there'd be wars and rumors of wars. It was that way when he left. It'll be that way till he gets back, except in America. We've been really special, really. To, boy, that's a blessing we can thank God for. Often take it for granted because we enjoy it so much. We just think it's normal. It's like breathing, right? Same with our creativity. Do you know that America represents 4% of the world's population? But when you can measure creativity in a number of ways, international patents and international copyrights. But when you look at, at, at creativity, every year America produces more technology, more scientific discoveries, more medical cures, more symphonies, more plays, more arts, more entertainment, more of everything than the other 96% of the world combined. Now, 4% of the world's population should produce 4% of the world's whatever. 
Our 4% every year produces more than the other 96%. Are you kidding me? See, we're so surrounded with stuff, we just kind of think this is normal life. Man, if you live in the rest of the world, you would love to be surrounded by what we're surrounded with, and we just take it for granted. The same with our prosperity. 4% of the world's population, yet America produces 25% of the world's gross domestic product, 25% of the world's wealth coming out of 4%. And it's not because we have greater natural resources. I'm a cowboy from Texas, got the ranch, everything that goes with it. So I'm in the agricultural community. Agriculture in America is only 1% of America's GDP. But our 1% of America's GDP, every year we in agriculture produce enough food to feed the entire world out of America. And it's not because we have greater farming land, because America is number 66 in the world in percentage of farmable land. There's 65 nations that have a greater percentage of farmable land than America does. But we take it at 66 and make it go further than anybody else in the world. I mean, we're blessed in so many ways that we just really take for granted. And when you look back over who we are in our country and our, and our government, et cetera, um, and, and by the way, with all those old documents, we own, I own textbooks from across the generation. I go back, very first textbook printed in America was 1690 in Boston. And we got from there all the way up to textbooks that were done last year. And so I see what's in textbooks and know it's there. And prior to World War II, when we taught about all these things that, taught students about all these things that America was and how different we were, we always told them that the reason we're different from all the other nations is because of the Bible. Now, there's no way you're going to hear that in a textbook today. But prior to World War II, we always said the Bible is what produced all this uniqueness in America. And even today in this secular culture, it's still very easy for me to prove that the Bible is still a huge influence in America even without us recognizing it. Part of that's just the way we talk to one another. Do you know there's 257 idioms or, or phrases that we quote to each other on a daily basis that are nothing more than Bible verses? I mean, you'll recognize them, the easy things, by the skin of your teeth. That's a Bible verse. I'll give you my two cents worth, Bible verse. A leopard can't change his spots. There's nothing new under the sun. Signs of the time, a thorn in the flesh. From the cradle to the grave, handwriting on the wall, a fly in the ointment, an eye for an eye. House divided. All of these are Bible verses. You hear them all the time. All of these phrases come out of the Bible. Let there be light, and my cup runneth over, and go the extra mile, and the promised land. As a matter of fact, we quote the Bible so much that back in the basketball playoff time, uh, whenever I hear someone quote the Bible on national news, I always write it down, send it to the office. We keep a log of it. ESPN was quoting the Bible dozens of times a day. Now, they didn't have a clue they were doing that. But their commentators were using all these Bible idioms and phrases, just throwing them back and fucking know their commentators, and most of them aren't Christians, and they're just quoting the Bible like crazy. See, we do this on a regular basis in America. Our speech is shaped by the Bible, shaped by the way the Bible talks. Now, if you want to have a lot of fun, next time you go to wherever you, you go, I don't know, you, you go to Walmart or you go to McDonald's or you go to Macy's or where, you're going to hear somebody quote one of those Bible phrases. And when you do, you need to stop them and say, Hey, did you know you just quoted a Bible verse? And they're going to look at you and say, no, I didn't. But the problem is they're going to say, what Bible verse was it? And we won't have a clue. I mean, we don't know where it came from. It's, see, every one of these has an address. Every one of them comes from a very specific place. But today, we don't really know that anymore, even as Christians. And where we are in the culture today, I think, is very well described by President John Quincy Adams, sixth president of the United States. He's a guy who got an early start. I mean, when he was eight years old, he had his musket out with the Massachusetts Minutemen. So John Quincy Adams grew up in the founding era. And sixth president of the United States, he said, with regard to the history contained in the Bible, it's not so much praiseworthy to be acquainted with it as it is shameful to be ignorant of it. Now, see, that's a cultural default because today, if you'd recognize those Bible verses, we'd be praising you. I can't believe you do the Bible so well that you recognize. Back in their day, they would have said, whoa, time out. You didn't know that came out of the Bible? How do you call yourself an educated person, not be familiar with the greatest book in the history of the world? See, for them, it was shameful not to know it. For us, it's become praiseworthy to know it. What a cultural shift that's been, a cultural default on our position in the Bible. You also have Teddy Roosevelt. And by the way, for the next few minutes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quoting presidents of the United States. I do that specifically because you would expect me or Pastor Rick, you'd expect us to say good things about the Bible. What you don't expect is that in American history, 
For nearly 150 years, it was the presidents of the United States who carried the water on the Bible. They were the ones all the time reminding the people how important the Bible was. Do you know we still have in America today what's called National Bible Week? National Bible Week was started, and that's where we really encourage all Americans to get in the Bible. It's a secular holiday. It was started by President Franklin Roosevelt, who said every America needs to spend the time between Thanksgiving and Christmas reading the Bible. He says that that's what makes us a nation. What's ma Can you imagine what would happen today if a president encouraged the nation to read the Bible? You'd have lawsuits like crazy. So it was the presidents that for a century and a half, they're the ones saying, guys, we don't survive without the Bible. Teddy Roosevelt said this. He said, the teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and so entwined with our civic and social life. Notice he did not say spiritual life. That's what we would say today. He said, no, no, no. We know it's spiritual life. He said, the Bible is so much part of our civic and our social life that it would be impossible for us to figure what life would be if these teachings were removed. He said, if you take out of America what the Bible produced, you would not even recognize America anymore. Now, most people today don't have a clue what he's talking about. Let me give you an example. We're talking about that economic prosperity that we have. That economic prosperity we enjoy as a nation when compared to all the other nations in the world. And by the way, to, to put it in perspective, we're, we're told that, you know, we have a real poverty problem here in America, that 20% of the nation lives in poverty. And let's just kind of define things because the World Bank is the entity that establishes the standard, um, the standard for, for poverty. And according to the World Bank, if you live on a dollar and 25 cents a day, you live in poverty about $460 a year. So uh, at, at this point, half the world lives on $1.25 a day or more. But they say if you're in a somewhat prospering nation, an industrial nation, and if you're in like one of our nations, they said that the standard for poverty is $2 a day income. That's $730 a year. One-fourth of the world lives at that level. So three-fourths of the world lives on $2 a day or less. That's the world right now. So that's the, that's the standard for poverty. It's two dollars a day or less, seven hundred thirty dollars, unless you're in America. Last year in America, we have eighty anti-poverty programs in government. We averaged spending sixty-one thousand dollars per poor family last year. Um, as a matter of fact, you'll find that if you live in poverty right now, what you make from government assistance is more than teachers make in thirteen states and more than secretaries make in thirty-nine states which is why everybody in the world wants to come to America and live in poverty. Because if they can just live in poverty here, they've elevated their lifestyle in an amazing way. So we talk about the poor in America. Um, everywhere else in the world, poverty in the world is characterized by malnutrition, by stuntedness, by thinness. The number one health problem for poverty in America is obesity. That's quite a different problem from the rest of the world. So see, our blessings are so big that even when we complain about what we don't have, we're still worlds higher than the rest of the world. So e even talking about economics, what's made economics so prosperous in America is the free market economic system. That, that's the system that has produced this. And it's interesting that if you know the history of America and know how the free market economic system got started, and it started here a century before it started in the rest of the world, you find that it came from five Bible verses. Historically, it came from 2 Thessalonians 3.10, 1 Timothy 5.8, Matthew 25, Luke 19, and Matthew 20. That's what produced the greatest economic engine in the history of the world. If you were to take the free market system out of America, you would not recognize America today. But most people have no clue that our free market system was the result of specific Bible verses that we applied early in our history. Same with our form of government. There are seven different forms of government in the world, and the Bible shows all seven. What America chose was what's called a Republican form of government. It comes directly. The founding fathers who chose that pointed to, to Exodus 18.21, Deuteronomy 1.15 and 16, Deuteronomy 16.18. That Bible verse says, choose out from among you. Leaders of tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands. You guys have elections. Elect your local county, state, and federal You see, when the pilgrims came to America, their pastor, John Robinson, told them, he said, when you get to America, do not use the political darkness that's characterized Europe. When you get there, you do what the Bible says. They got there, they started having elections, and they elected both their state leaders and their church leaders, whereas everybody in Europe has got a king. They've got a monarch. You don't, you don't elect your leaders. They're, they're appointed or they're born. In America, we started, see, that's the birth of the Republican form of government, which is what's characterized us, which is what Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution requires. We're not allowed to become a democracy. That is one of the seven human forms of government. 
America is required to maintain, quote, a Republican form of government. That means we elect our leaders. We choose them at all levels. That's what the Bible set forth. That's what we did. If you took away our Republican form of government where we elected our leaders, we elected them at all these levels, you wouldn't recognize America. But how many people today know that our Republican form of government was based on the Bible? Well, we used to, and that's why Teddy Roosevelt said, guys, if you take what the Bible did in our civic and social life, if you take it away, you wouldn't even recognize America today. Exactly. But see, we just don't know that today. And then you have people like Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt said, in the former days of the Republic, the directing influence the Bible exercised on the fathers of the nation is conspicuously evident. Really? Try finding that in a textbook today. It's conspicuously absent. We're told the Founding Fathers were a collective group of atheists and agnostics and deists, and they didn't believe in God. And I have a lot of fun at law schools and universities when I go there. I'll put up a picture of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, those 56 guys that we celebrated last Tuesday. And I, I asked, and I was at Duke University Law School, really sharp kids. And I asked them, say, tell me who you recognize up there out of those 56. There's Ben Franklin. There's Thomas Jefferson. Dead silence after that. I go, okay, you got two of the 56. How about some more? They can't. I said, let me go across the front row. And so I'll show them Benjamin Harrison. And right beside Benjamin Harrison, you get, um, you get Richard Henry Lee. And beside him is George Clinton. Beside him is Sam Adams. The guy looking backward the opposite direction is Charles Carroll. The guy on the front row with the light brown jackets, Robert Morris. Right behind him is Benjamin Rush. Next to him, leaning on his elbows, Elbridge Jerry. Next to him is Robert Tree Payne. I go through the other 54 names. They don't have a clue who they are. Isn't it interesting? We've all been trained to recognize the two least religious founding fathers. We can find Jefferson and Franklin. Do you know out of the 56 guys who signed the Declaration of Independence, 29 of them graduated from schools that in their day were seminaries and Bible schools. Well, half these guys are ministry trained. All we know is Franklin and Jefferson. We don't know anything about the rest of these guys. And the same at Southern University Law School, great law school, a traditional black uh, university law school. And I put up that same picture of the signer's declaration and said, you know, isn't it unfortunate that America was started by a bunch of racists and bigots and slave owners? And everybody said, yeah. I said, by the way, who up there owned slaves? Well, Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. All right, give me somebody else. They could not give me a single other one of those 56 who owned slaves. I said, now, wait a minute, let's see if I got this right. One guy owned slaves, and therefore that means they're all racist, bigots, and slave owners? And they instantly said, mm, that's not a safe place to go. And then I start going through all the founding fathers that started abolition societies, that led the abolition movement, that were huge anti-slavery. As it turns out, one-fourth of the founding fathers, particularly from the South, were, were pro-slavery. Three-fourths were anti-slavery. Matter of fact, we teach black, black history so poorly today. We think black history started with MLK, which was a great, great part of American history. But we never talk about the first black elected office in America, 1768, Wentworth Cheswell in New Hampshire, how that he was reelected re for 49 years, held eight different political positions. We never talk about Thomas Hercules, black elected office, 1793 in, in Pennsylvania. We never talk about the fact that in Massachusetts there never was a time when blacks could not vote all the time. We don't talk about the fact that when the U.S. Constitution was ratified in Baltimore, more blacks than whites voted to ratify the U.S. Constitution in Baltimore. You'll never hear names like Lemuel Haynes or Prince Estabrook, Peter Salem. You never hear, hear names like John Moran. We got so much. Did you know Hoosiers in Indiana? Hoosiers in Indiana, the nickname? They're named after a black evangelist named Harry Hoosier who preached all over Indiana. How many people living in Indiana know they were named after a black evangelist? You know, no, no shot. See, we teach history so poorly in so many areas. So, you come back up here, oh, founding fathers, no, 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 they, they didn't believe in the Bible. Yeah, well, here's the president saying, it's evident. Well, if you read the historical documents, as he continued. He said, we cannot read the history of our rise and development as a nation without reckoning with the place the Bible's occupied in shaping the advances of the republic. He said, there's no way you can read American history and not see that every time we were moving forward is because we're following the Bible. Now, America, like every other nation, we got warts in our nose. But unlike other nations, we have a whole lot less warts than other nations have. We have a whole lot more things that have gone right. 241 years kind of proves that. 
So he said, every time you see advances, it's because of the Bible. Now, he's talking about the founding fathers and the Bible was evident in what they did. Let, let me take you to a founding father like Ben Franklin, because he is one of the five least religious. 250 founding fathers is one of the five least religious. Ben Franklin, he's a unique guy. He came up with the concept of the United States of America back in 1754, 20 years before the American Revolution. He's saying, guys, let's not be 13 states. Let's be the United States. Well, it didn't happen. But 22 years later, he's one of the 56 guys who signs the Declaration of independence saying let's have a nation so he's actually getting to see what he's wanted for 22 years start happening seven years later he's one of only three guys who signs the peace treaty to end the american revolution now we have the opportunity genuinely to be a nation and four years later he is sitting at the constitutional convention helping create the united states of america he's wanted this for 33 years first guy to come up with the idea he's loving this and by the way this has been franklin right there uh, white-haired guy he's 81 years old he's by far the the oldest guy at the, at the convention and, you know, he's not real impressive to us today because the average lifespan in America today is 80 years old. So he's 81, so what? <laughs> Do you know what the average lifespan was when they signed the Constitution? It was 33 years old was the average lifespan. Which means that if you're a high school senior and you're here this morning and you'd been alive back then, you would have already had your midlife crisis. Because, I mean, <laughs> when, when you hit 17, it's more than half over for you. You're sliding from 17, man. It's... So he's 81 years old. He's loving this at least first, but it didn't go the way he had planned. Because you see, turns out all the states came with their own agendas. You had the New York plan, you had the New Jersey plan, you had the Connecticut plan, you had the Virginia plan. And Virginia didn't want the Connecticut plan. Connecticut didn't want the New York plan. New York didn't want the New Jersey plan. So everybody's got their own agenda. So there's so much fighting and bickering going on at the Constitutional Convention that five weeks in the convention is starting to fall apart. You have Alexander Hamilton. He's out of there. He's going back to New York. He's got better things to do. You got George Mason, Virginia. He's, he's tired of fighting and bickering with everybody. He's going home. So this thing is falling apart, and as it is falling apart, Franklin gives the longest speech he gave at the Constitutional Convention, Thursday, June the 28th, 1787. I want you to see what Franklin told the other delegates. He said, gentlemen, he said, in this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth and scarce able to distinguish it when presented to us, how has it happened, sir, that we've not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding? He said, in the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. And by the way, back at the beginning, this is the room in which they signed the Declaration of Independence. And back then, we had one Congress. We didn't have a House and Senate, just one Congress. But they had two chaplains. And oh man, did we pray a lot back then. Did the government call us to pray a lot? As a matter of fact, by 1815, there had been 1,400 government-issued calls to prayer in America. I mean, we were into praying big time. He said, guys, don't you remember what we used to do in this room? He said, our prayers, sir, were heard. And they were graciously answered. He said, all of us engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of superintending providence in our favor. And have we now forgotten that powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? He said, I have lived, sir, a long time. Yes, he had. I've lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. He said, if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We've been assured in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. He said, I firmly believe this. And I also believe that without his concurring aid, we should succeed in this political building no better than builders of Babel, and we should become a reproach and a byword down to future generations. He says, I therefore beg leave and move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberation be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. Now, Matt point out that's not bad for your least religious founding father. <laughs> I mean, he has just chewed the other guys out for not praying enough. But what I want you to see is this. that You, you just saw his speech. That speech is 14 sentences long. Here's the question I've got. How many Bible verses did you just recognize that Ben Franklin quoted? The answer is 14. These are the Bible verses Ben Franklin just quoted. Now, if you recognize those 14, we'll be praising you today. I can't believe you knew the Bible so well. The least religious founding father knew the Bible that well. See, here we are today, we praise you. Back then, it was shameful not to know the Bible. Now, to, to give you the, 
the rest of the story uh, of what went on here. Um, after Franklin made the call, they adjourned for three days, kind of a cooling off period. Let's back away a little bit and let things settle down. And George Washington said that they went to church where they listened to patriotic orations. So for three days, they take off. They, they go to church. And while they're at church, the Reverend William Rogers had special prayer over them. He had the Constitutional Convention sitting right there in front of him at church, and everybody in Philadelphia knew what was happening. This thing is falling apart. People are angry, and they're leaving. And, and he's got them there, and, and so he prayed a prayer over them. But it's not the kind of a civic prayer we would pray over a school board meeting. You know, God bless the school board. Amen. It's not that kind of a deal. The prayer was so significant, they printed it on the front page of the newspapers. I actually own the original prayer that he prayed over the Constitutional Convention. And that prayer on the front page of the newspapers covers three-fourths of the front page. It is a real prayer. I mean, he was, God help these, they, there's division, help them have unity, give them wisdom, have them have ideas. That, and he just prayed and prayed and prayed. So after three days of going to church, after three days of listening to sermons, after three days of, of having special prayer, they come back and delegates like Jonathan Dayton said, the whole atmosphere had shifted. It was, you know, what was a really dumb idea last week is, eh, that's really not all that bad once you think about it. And, and so the atmosphere shifted. So they go from five weeks of failure to three days of mind renewing, they come out and 10 weeks later come out with the constitution under which we still govern ourselves today. That's the oldest constitution in the history of the world is what they produce and it almost didn't happen. Those three days, that turning point. Now, if you know the Bible and you read the constitution, you see Bible verses all over it. But you see, they knew the Bible so well back then that they didn't feel like they had to tell you they were quoting the Bible. Everybody recognized it. Today we have to say, I'm quoting to you from John 3.16. Now Matthew 6 says, and over here we see in Job 4, see we have to tell people when we're quoting the Bible. They, back then, didn't have to tell it. And yet there's professors, like two professors over at Cornell University who have a book called The Godless Constitution. They say, oh, founding fathers are secular. The Constitution is secular. When somebody tells me that the Constitution is a secular or a godless document, what they've actually done is they have told me that they are biblically illiterate. They wouldn't recognize a Bible verse if it bit them in the ankle because there's Bible verses all over the document, but they don't recognize them. And therefore, it's a secular document. See, that's the way history has turned. And yet, when you go back to the original things, and if you know the scriptures and look at what the scriptures appear there, it's real easy to see. see and this history was so self-evident that even our least religious presence, like Andrew Jackson, I mean, even for him, it was a no-brainer. He said, the Bible is the rock on which our republic rests. And then you have presence like Zachary Taylor. And, and Taylor is an old war hero. His nickname is Old Rough and Ready. Look what Zachary Taylor said. He said, the Bible is the best of books. I wish it were in the hands of everyone. He said, it's indispensable to the safety and permanence of our institutions. He's saying... Our institutions, not our faith. See, we would say our faith. He said, no, no, the Bible is indispensable to our institutions. And you'll notice that the more secular our institutions become, the less well they operate. The more secular judiciary becomes, the less well it operates. The more secular government becomes, the less well it operates. The more secular education becomes, the less well it operates. The more secular economics. See, our institutions, the permanence and safety of our institutions are based on the Bible. He continued. He says, especially should the Bible be placed in the hands of the young. It is the best school book in the world. I would that all of our people were brought up under the influence of that holy book. Best school book. He can't say that. That's, that's unconstitutional. He can't say that. What an irony that for us to do today what we did for two centuries in America now is unconstitutional under the same constitution we've always had. We haven't changed that constitution, same one. And for two centuries, it was the best school book in the world. The Bible was, not today. That's unconstitutional. But you say we used to know our history, and that's why we had different policies. Uh, for example, Benjamin Rush, I mentioned he's called the father of public schools under the Constitution. You see, what he did was that we used to have 13 states, and he's, a great, he's considered one of the top three educators in the founding era. He, we used to have 13 states. Now we got one nation. What are we going to have to teach in our schools to keep us one nation instead of going back to 13 states? He said... Only thing that'll, that'll solve that problem is the Bible. He came out with a piece that gave a dozen reasons we would never, ever take the Bible out of public schools in America. Father of public schools under the Constitution saying never take the Bible out of schools. Matter of fact, at the end of his piece, he did this March the 10th, 1791. At the end of the piece, he says, if any future generation ever takes the Bible out of schools, they're going to spend all their time and money fighting crime when they could have prevented crime right there in the classroom. You know... 
And I, I can show you so many other founders that said the same thing, which is why it was, an, it was not a hard decision for the Supreme Court. For example, in 1844, a case called Vidal versus Girard's executors, the U.S. Supreme Court in a unanimous decision said, now, nah, if you're going to be a government-run school in America, you will teach the Bible. We're not going to fund any government school that won't teach the Bible. Really? Now, how many of you got that case in your history book? How many of you heard about a unanimous? See, we don't talk about that history. What we talk about is modern history. And that's why we go to the Supreme Court in 1963, Appenin, Shemp, Murray, Collette. That's the first case in American history where the court said, oh, you can't do this Bible thing in schools anymore. And the judges who gave us that decision specifically said that taking the Bible out of schools, which they did, they said taking the Bible out of schools was without historical or legal precedent. It had never before happened in the history of the United States. There's no legal basis for it, no historical. Then why did you do it? I've been involved in seven cases of the U.S. Supreme Court. If you want to know why the court does what it does, you go read the decision of the court. It's online. You can read it. And when you do, you'll find this statement. It says, if portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could be and had been psychologically harmful to the child. <laughs> what? We've discovered the Bible causes brain damage. We have to save our kids from brain damage. I would argue we've suffered massive brain damage since we've taken the Bible out of schools. I mean, for 5,500 years, we knew that God made them male and female. There were two genders. If you're not aware, legally today, there are 92 different genders. And matter of fact, if you're on Facebook, you can choose from 64 different genders for your profile. God made them male and female. No, there's 92. Whatever you want. See, we've lost our brains. The brain damage has come since we've gotten away from the Bible. We don't have any common sense anymore. I mean, what used to be real simple common sense, it, it, different direction. Well, this is, this is what happened at that point in time. And Benjamin Rush warned us exactly what would happen. He said, the Bible, when not read in schools, is seldom read in any subsequent period of life. And we know statistically that the younger you are when you start reading the Bible, the more likely it is to be a lifelong habit throughout your life. You can start when you're older, but you have to work harder to make it a lifelong habit. If you start when you're, and the Bible was the number one textbook in schools, we learn to read out of the Bible in our public schools. Government's not going to pay for a, a public school that, that won't teach the Bible. When you start down there, it becomes a lifelong habit. See, that's why we have such high biblical illiteracy in America today. We've gone 60 years without starting to read down here the Bible when we're young. And we try to get into it when we're 30 or when we're 40 or we're 50 or whatever it is. And it's a lot harder. It's harder to make it a daily lifelong habit. Now, over, if, you, if you keep up with news, and I do, I'm very much involved in political community. We have a network of 800 state legislators that we work with, very involved in, in the federal Congress and involved with what happens in courts, etc. These are all issues that have been in the news in the last 12 months, every one of them. And you look at these issues that we've had national debates on, the significance of all of these issues is, and, you know, capital gains, tax, progressive tax, whatever, it is, the significance is the Bible has specific verses that deal with each one of those issues. The Bible specifically talks about progressive taxes and capitation taxes and capital gains taxes and estate taxes and a minimum wage. Most Christians today can't give you a single verse on any of those topics, but they're there. We see the biblical literacy has moved us away that we don't see that anymore. And Benjamin Rush, I mean, again, he was so wise in the Bible. Benjamin Rush said, the Bible contains more knowledge necessary to man in his present state than any other book in the world. And I would argue that just virtually every issue that comes up today, whether it's environmental stuff, or whether it's social programs, the Bible deals with that. And if you know the Bible, it was, it was a no-brainer when we knew the Bible, because here's what the Bible says about these technology changes, but human nature doesn't change. The issues don't change, it's technology changes. So you look at where we are, there's a lot of historical evidence. I'm going to close out this morning by just giving you some examples. I want to take you to a guy named Matthew Maury. We don't talk about him anymore. He used to be in all of our textbooks. Matthew Maury is a guy who grew up in the late founding era. He grew up listening to speeches of James Madison, etc. But this is a guy who loved the sea. When he was a little single-digit kid, he went, to, he went to sea as a cabin boy. And he loved it, and he stayed on, became a sailor, became an officer, became a captain, became the owner of a ship, became the owner of a bunch of ships. He loved the sea. And he is the guy who discovered back in the 1800s, mid-1800s, he discovered there are jet streams in the ocean. That if you'll get your ship over here about 50 miles, you'll get to Europe two weeks faster than everybody else, which is huge. And we know there's jet streams in the ocean today. I mean, if you watch Finding Nemo, you know there's a jet stream going to Australia, you know? So, <laughs> real easy. So, we know there's jet... He did this back when there's no satellites, no technology. 
He found the jet. See, he's called the, the father of oceanography because he found these currents that take you from one continent to the other. And if you get over in these commercial shipping lanes, which we call them that today, if you get over there, you're going to get there. You're going to get to Australia faster from Africa. And if you want to go from Australia to Asia, here's the amazing. The guy did that back at that point in time. Now, he loved the sea and he was home sick one day. And he had his family read the Bible to him. They were reading out of Psalm 8. And this is the passage in Psalm 8. It says, Thou madest man to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatever passes through the path of the sea. He said, whoa, whoa, read that again. See, what jumped at him was whatever passes through the path of the sea. He said, I've been on the sea my whole life. I've never seen a path in the sea. Read that again. Paths in the sea. Read it again. And they kept reading, and they weren't seeing what he was caught on. But he, he said, if God says there's pathways in the sea, there's pathways, I've got to find them. Where, where are the pathways? And that's what led him literally to discover what we now call the path. He's called the pathfinder of the seas because he found the pathways in seas because he read the Bible, and the Bible told him there are pathways in the sea. But that's not the only thing the Bible did. Matter of fact, Ecclesiastes 1.6 has this verse. It says, the wind goes toward the south and turns around toward the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on a circuit. The wind whirls around. There, there is a circular motion. Yeah. And he's the guy who discovered jet streams in the air, that there are circular motions going around one hemisphere this direction, other hemisphere in the opposite direction. Wait a minute. He's doing all this without satellites? How can he? See, he found that out of the Bible. That's why for the first time in human history, weather prediction became possible. Because he found that there are patterns to the wind and how they go and where they blow and what direction. And he would say, uh, see the way the wind's going? You guys wait a, a week, set sail next week. It's going to be good weather. If you set sail this week, it's going to be really. See, he's called also the father of naval meteorology. Now, he found all this science stuff out of the Bible. Absolutely. But you see, back then, same as today, nothing changes. Technology does. Back then, they said, oh, science and Bible are incompatible. And he said, he says, I've been blamed by men of science, both in this country and in England, for quoting the Bible in confirmation of the doctrines of physical geography. The Bible, they say, was not written for scientific purposes and is therefore of no authority in matters of science. Bible doesn't apply to science. We hear that today. You Christians are a bunch of anti-science Neanderthals. You're standing in the way of science. Same thing back then. He says, I beg pardon. He says, the Bible is authority for everything it touches. The Bible is true and science is true. They're both true. And when your men of science with vain and hasty conceit announce the discovery of disagreement between them, science and religion, incompatible, he said, rely on it. The fault is not with the witness or his records, that is with God. He said, but it's with the worm, the sinful human who attempts to interpret evidence which he does not understand. So he said, you just wait. Science will always catch up with the Bible. Now, I have a presentation I do on science in the Bible, and I'll show you even on environmental science. I'll show you the 10 great teachings from environmental science 35 years ago. Every one of them you would laugh at today. But headlines of news 35 years ago, science proves that, and you go through all the things. See, Bible, science always catches up with the Bible. Where science is today compared to 35 years ago, environmental science is back around to where the Bible is. Now, we still got some wacky stuff that 35 years from now is going to come back around. But that's just the nature of, of secular science. God is the great scientist. He's the one who created the molecules. He understands the structure. He put the stars in place. He's got astronomy down. He's, he's got earth science down. He's got, he's got geo. He's got it all. And so we go to his book and find it, and that's what we used to do. Other guys moving real quickly, John Adams, we know he has a huge influence on the formation of American government. Now, we have three branches of government. That's no big deal. Lots of countries did. Isaiah 33, 22 tells us to have three branches of government. What we did was he said, there's constitutional separation of powers. We're going to have checks and balances between the three branches. And that's one of the things that's caused America to last longer than any other nation is we have checks and balances between the three branches. Where did we get that? According to John Adams in several writings, he said, well, it came out of Jeremiah 17.9. And then you've got James Kent, who's the father of our judicial system. When we created the judicial system in America, we made judges circuit judges. The U.S. Supreme Court judges used to get on horseback and ride a circuit. You didn't go to Washington, D.C. for the cases. They went out and rode the circuit. Today, they're still circuit judges, but now they do it electronically. But circuit judges? Where do we get that? 
guy who created that said, well, we got that out of 1 Samuel 7, 15 and 16. That's the Bible. I had circuit judges. Samuel was a judge. It says he rode the circuit from Gilgal to Mizpah. All right, we're going to ride the circuit too because that's what God did with judges. And then you've got the first hospital in America done by Ben Franklin's Pennsylvania Hospital. Why did he do it? If you want to see why he started the first health care system, you go to the old entrance of the Pennsylvania Hospital, not the new one. Go to the old one. And it's got the logo that Ben Franklin created right there. And it tells you exactly why he did what he did. And it's based on what he saw in Luke 10 35. You've also got folks like um, Alexander Hamilton who specifically quotes Exodus 31 18 as the reason that we have a written constitution. By the way, James Madison quotes the same verse. I mean, verse after verse after verse is what has made us unique. That's what our presidents used to keep reminding us of. And today we're looking at this like deer in a headlight. Man, I've never heard this stuff before. But it's part of who we are. And by the way, if you're interested in this stuff, on the table out back, we've got what's called the Founder's Bible, where we show you specifically the Bible verse that were used in science and technology and economics, because we've got all those 100,000 writings. I and mean, we can show you where they got their ideas. It's got apps as well, so if you want modern technology. But the problem we have, you know, Benjamin Rush said, hey, everything you need to know comes out of the Bible. Well, the problem is we no longer know the Bible well. Um, we're at a point today in America where the 4.4, the, the average home has 4.4 Bibles. But the average Christian, only 14% of Christians read through, the, read through the Bible on a daily basis. Well, just because you read the Bible on a daily basis, maybe you stick with your favorite psalm every day. Have you ever read the Bible cover to cover? And polling shows that only 3% of Christians have read the Bible from cover to cover. 97% of Christians don't know what's in the book that they're supposed to live by. What the, three weeks ago, the largest study on worldview ever done in America was finished, and we find that 4% of millennials have a biblical worldview, and only 10% of Christians in general have a biblical worldview. So 90% of Christians don't know what the Bible says about certain specific issues that are around us on a daily basis. So what we need to do is get back in, in that word. So I'll close with this final statement by John Quincy Adams. We started with him. We'll finish with him. John Quincy Adams wrote so much about the Bible that in 1848 they took his writings of the Bible and created a textbook for 10-year-old Americans to show 10-year-old Americans how to read through the Bible from cover to cover once every year. Now again, you can imagine what would happen if a president today were to do a book for 10-year-olds showing them how to read the Bible cover. He did. And this is what he tells 10-year-olds. He says, students, he says, no book in the world deserves to be so unceasingly studied and so profoundly meditated on as the Bible. And he's a brilliant guy. He's a steel trap mind. He spoke seven languages. He was appointing confirmed the U.S. Supreme Court, turned it down. One of the greatest legal minds in history. He's called old man eloquent because he was such a great orator, great speech. He's a brilliant guy. He said, the one book you study more than any other, and he read books in every language. One book you study more than any other is the Bible. He says, I myself for many years have made it a practice to read through the Bible once every year. That's what we did in America. You start reading the Bible when you're in elementary school and you keep it every year. You have Bible every year. He says, my custom is to read four or five chapters every morning immediately after rising from bed. It employs about an hour of my time and seems to me the most suitable manner of beginning of the day. Wait a minute. You're president of the United States and you've got all this conflict going on, but you take one hour every morning in the Bible, four or five chapters, yeah. And your Secretary of State, and you did, yeah, I did it when I was Secretary of State. I did it when I was U.S. Senator. I did it for my 17 years in the House. I did it when I was foreign diplomat to five different nations. The guy's unbelievable. He spent 70 years in public service, and every morning he spends the first hour in the Bible, three to four, four, the three to four chapters, now, <clears throat> or four to five chapters. I'm going to challenge you. If you have not read through the Bible from cover to cover, Make a commitment this morning that 12 months from now, I will have finished that. But you don't have to spend an hour a day. You don't have to read four to five chapters. If you will read 3.2 chapters a day, about 15 minutes, you can do it. And by the way, you can also have the Bible read to you on an app. So while you're combing your hair and brushing your teeth, it'll read the 3.2 chapters to you. 15 minutes, you can be through the Bible in a year. It's not that hard a deal. Make the commitment to do it. And by the way, if you have already done that before, do it again. I mean, go through it every year. Um, one of our founding fathers, Elias Boudinot, he signed the peace treaty in the American Revolution, one of the framers of the Bill of Rights. When he was 77 years old, he founded the American Bible Society. He said, he said, I've read through the Bible more than 50 times in my life. He said, and every time I go through it, I see things I have never seen before. See, the Bible calls itself unsearchable. You will not get to the bottom of the wisdom in that book. 
And so he says, guys, go through the Bible. He said, I start my day with it every day. And then he said, I've always endeavored to read it with the same spirit, which I now recommend to you. Ten-year-olds, perk your ears up here. This is the way I want you to read. He's telling ten-year-olds, here's the way you need to read the Bible the way I read it. He says, I've always read it with the intention and desire that it may contribute to my advance in wisdom and virtue. He said, I'm not looking for a devotional book. I, this is not a spiritual advocation. He says, I'm looking for something that will change. I want practical application. I want something that will change the way I think, my wisdom. I want something that will change the way I act, my virtue. See, we read the Bible as a practical book. Wow, look what it says about economics. Oh, look what it says about foreign affairs over here. Look what it says about agriculture. We were always looking for application. And when you go into the Bible with that eye, man, does it come alive. So many things start popping out. So challenge you again, go through the Bible with that eye. Not just, you'll get blessed by it, but don't, don't read it to be blessed. Read it to find something specific to apply, and when you do, you get blessed by it. So I'll close out with this promise that God gives us in Joshua 1.8. Joshua 1.8, God says, if you'll constantly think about my word every day and every night, so be sure to obey it, then you'll be prosperous and successful. See, that's what made America different from all other nations. We have warts in our nose for sure. But more than any other nation, we tried to apply the Bible. And we therefore have been more prosperous and more successful than any nation in the history of the world. We get away from that. It ain't going to work out too well. Same with our individual lives. Same with our family life. Same with anything else we're involved in. If we get the Bible back at the center of it, we will be prosperous and successful. God gave us that promise. So let me challenge you. Take that Bible. Be practical with it. Whatever you're involved with, look for practical applications of that to your profession. Look for stuff around you. Take the newspaper. Look at the headlines. See if you can find Bible verses to deal with it. Bible applies to everything in life. God bless you guys. Thanks for letting me share. Did you learn anything today? <laughs> How many of you come away from that saying, man, I got to get in the Bible more? Isn't that awesome? I love that. And you may say, you mean we, we do elections now because it, it, they got it from the Bible? Well, we're still doing elections. How come we're not doing as well? Because they never thought that the electorate would not know anything about the Bible. See, so, so now, because we don't have the Bible as our foundation, we elect people that don't have the Bible as their foundation. And it's hurting us all over the place. So thank you, brother, for sharing that. Thank you for putting that uh, history back out to be seen again. And we pray for you and God to continue to bless that uh, ministry of wall builders. We really do. And now, uh, Nicole Tice, come on up. Nicole's also going to share uh, Patriots Academy and uh, that it's going to happen. It happens every summer here in Delaware, and we've got some people from our church going to it. It's a, it, To me, it's a goal for our young people to be able to discover this, and Delaware Family Policy has started this. Uh, I think you said that David was part of establishing some of this, or at least he knows about the Patriots Academy. So she's going to share about it, and, and when we're done, uh, we're going to have ushers at the doors with a basket. You can give to this and, and support that, support these kids, support other kids around the state that are going also, and just become a part of this arm of getting our young people to know more of our real history and how to get it into the government structure. Thank you, Pastor Rick, and um, thank you for allowing me to be here, and I'm so thankful for the support of this church who's been with us since the very beginning. Um, and being involved in um, the arena or mountain of government and education and family and seeing, um, well, I mean, you just heard what David said. I mean, how many of you got that truth in high school or college? Anybody? I, I certainly didn't, and I know that my parents didn't. So now, you know, uh, he stated how the millennial generation, only 4% of them have a biblical worldview. Well, I'm just curious, how many do we have in here between the ages of 12 and 25, right? Would you all stand up if you're in the ages of 12 and 25? Just stand up real quick. 12 and 25. Okay, thanks. You can sit down. I mean, take a look at that. So if it was 4% for the millennials, what do you think it's going to be for their generation? That's Generation X. I'm sorry, that's me. They're Generation Z. So um, our point is we've got to work really hard at making sure that we do our part 
and getting that truth to the next generation, just like what Pastor Rick was talking about. So one of the programs that we're doing is called um, the Patriot Academy. It's only three days out of the year, very intense three days. And um, we focus on that age group of 16 to 25. So it's it's not a summer camp. It's, it's very intense leadership training for young adults who are Christians and want to know how do we be effective and stand in this culture? How do we get the truth back out into the culture? How do we become influencers? So you've got young people among you today who are making that step. And my goodness, do they need your support. We need your help in getting them ready to lead in a way that we never have or was really required of us in our generation, but it's different now for them. So I just want to introduce you, just you, you have a handful here from your congregation who are going who need your support. The tuition to attend Patriot Academy is $550. We have about 18 students who need significant help in raising tuition. Um, and But I want to introduce the ones from your congregation here. So if you all would stand, if you're attending Patriot Academy, would you do that? So over here, we've got Lauren. You guys recognize Lauren? She's on the keyboard and sings so beautifully here. I thank God that she's going to learn um, how to make a difference in her generation. Um, we've got Reagan Tice. She's my daughter here. And then you've got um, Tieran Gingrick. You heard Summer, her little sister. See, that's purposeful cultivating right there. And then you've got Tieran who's going to be attending. Um, and then you've got Evan Hunt from your body here that's going to be attending. And all need help with tuition. So we encourage you to be a part of this process. Let's lock arms and get this next generation ready to lead and influence and take truth out into all the arenas of the culture. Thank you, Pastor Ray. Thank you. And we appreciate Nicole and Delaware Family Policy and all their efforts to uh, to work in, in that arena. Okay, Gail said for me to do the announcements. So the biggest announcement is, read your announcements. Uh, VBS sign-up is still out there, so sign your kids up for VBS. It's going to be the first time we're going to add the new buildings into VBS, so a lot of the creativity that is possible. It's going to be neat to see what happens there. Also, the 5 to 10 ministry on Tuesday, uh, the uh, pastor David Perdue is coming from uh, Milford Baptist to share his testimony. And it's just awesome to see what God's doing with pastors coming and giving that and the connectivity that it, it is creating. I remember we started supporting uh, uh, Milford Baptist because we had some parents that had some kids go there. The pa pastor had called me up and, uh, you know, to verify. And I said, okay, pastor, uh, we've been trying to help, you know, virtually all the Christian schools around. And we're going to talk about doing support your way. He said, well, I didn't call for that. And uh, the board passed it. We started supporting them monthly, added them on to that list. And uh, because of that, we invited four of their leaders to come and be part of our thank you dinner at the end of the year. And the pastor called me the very next day and said, Pastor, I did not know you were helping other schools too. I didn't know you were helping other ministries also. And, and he said that it just blew me away. And he said, I realize we've got to open our heart to, to be more open to connect with ministries. And, and now to have him come and give a testimony is just awesome to see the spirit of what God is doing and doing a breakthrough. So that's happening at 5 to 10 ministry on Tuesday, 10 o'clock. There's a dinner afterwards also. And I'm telling you, it's, it's usually great for, you know, why is it called 5 to 10? Because we ask everybody to give at least 5 or $10. And some people give more, and it always is enough to bless the speakers and the singers and take care of the food expense. And we've all already got three bus trips planned to events with the buses already paid for, all coming out of that ministry. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a great influence, and it's been marvelous to be a part of it. So if you can, come on out on Tuesday to hear uh, Pastor David Perdue. Okay, uh, why don't you stand? We're going to pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for that word and the history that is coming alive. Lord, let it stir our hearts to know that uh, our focus ought to be on you and your word and putting it into our lives. We ought to celebrate that and be grateful that these freedoms we have are not by accident. They've come from you. So we give you praise for that, Lord. 
uh, bless David and his ministry. And Lord, as we go out this week, may we use these seven days wisely, walking with you, being filled with your presence, giving you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said.